Welcome everyone. Um, you are joining in on the Shoreline Development webinar with myself and Daniela Klisfer. Just while you're joining here, um, you can write in the chat box where you're from. Um, yeah, where you're zooming in from tonight. I apologize, my video isn't working, but I am here as support. Um, and I, I also work at the Coastal Center with Daniela. And I can start it off. I am zooming in from my home office in Ben Miller, which is uh, pretty close to Goderich. And I'm uh, zooming in from home office in Goderich as well. Oh, we have someone here from King Carden, and she appreciates the view of the North Pier. Excellent. So as we're waiting for another minute, if you're, uh, feel free to post where you're joining us from today in the chat box. This will not be part of the recording. Uh, Oh, we have um, someone from Godrich, close to us. Oh, Daniela, we have someone from Michigan, which is great to see. On the other side, welcome. Thank you for joining. So we'll just give it about one more minute and then we'll get started here. We have someone from the Blue Water Shoreline Resident Association. Great to see. Amberly, perfect. Welcome, welcome. Okay, so I think we can get started here, Alyssa. So I want to welcome everyone today uh, to our third webinar of our 2021 Coastal Series. My name is Danielle Klisper. I work at the Lake Huron Centre for Coastal Conservation as the Coastal Stewardship Coordinator. And my colleague Alyssa, uh, Alyssa will be monitoring the chat box and the Q&A function today. So uh, that should be visible on the bottom of your screen. So feel free to post any questions in those boxes uh, and we'll try to respond to those throughout the presentation and hopefully uh, as many as we can at the end of the webinar as well. Oh, there we go. So our webinar is brought to you by generous funding from our sponsors li listed here. Uh, we're running this webinar from Godrich today, and we would like to acknowledge that we're in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of the three fires known as the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi Nations. And we further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saugeen and the Chippewas of Maywash, now known as the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation, and uh, as traditional keepers of this land. And we would also like to recognize as well that there's shared rights uh, that exist near Godrich, where uh, their territory, territory overlaps with uh, the territory of Amjanong First Nation, Walpool Island First Nation and the Chippewas of Kettle and Stony Point as well. So for those not familiar, the, coast, the Lake Huron Centre for Coastal Conservation was founded in 1998 uh, with the goals of protecting and restoring the Lake Huron's coastal environment. We're a non-governmental, not-for-profit charitable organization and we have a small but mighty team of four staff of which two of us on the call, are on the call today. So to get started, the Great Lakes hold about 20% of the world's fresh water, and Lake Huron is the second largest of those Great Lakes. Our lake's steepest point is about uh, 750 feet with a shoreline of over 6,000 kilometers long, and that includes the islands as well. It also has a residence time of 22 years. Uh, so if Lake Huron were to become seriously contaminated, it would take about 22 years for the lake to recharge or replace its water. In comparison, uh, Lake Superior is uh, at 191 years and Lake Erie is at uh, 2.6 years. So this shows the importance of reducing those human inputs 
because of those long-term impacts that they can have on our lake's health. And our shoreline is a complex web of interacting features of natural processes and of ecological communities that provide us with a rich diversity of life and uh, ecosystem services for all to enjoy. So we have about 10 different ecosystems, uh, including our famous beaches and dunes and our uh, turquoise near shore water. So all of these ecosystem, ecosystems are limited in size and they're under increasing pressure from human interaction. We also have many endangered species along the shoreline. So species at risk are animals and plants whose populations are at risk from habitat destruction, from urbanization, pesticides and others. Um, the province of Ontario has legislation called the Endangered Species Act and that aims to protect those vulnerable population. Here at the Coastal Centre, we're currently working on enhancing habitat for uh, these three species, the famous piping plover, the pitcher thistle and the monarch butterfly, but we also work uh, to enhance um, populations of other species at risk as well. And there's also many threats to Lake Huron's coastal uh, ecosystem. So population growth and development, uh, those two can bring both economic benefits. However, with more people, it means uh, greater demand for water access. It means more potential pollution and more potential stress on those species and on those habitats of the shore. So a balance, of, uh, a balance is continually needed between the socioeconomic demands, uh, residents' expectations, and conservation to ensure that the, shore, the shoreline is wisely managed for both existing residents and for future residents as well. When it comes to water pollution, so water runoff from the land, whether it be from a rainstorm, car washing, or water crops um, and lawns, that all can pick up soil, it can pick up oil, sorry, it can pick up salt from the roadways, uh, agricultural chemicals and fertilizers, and also toxic materials. And all of that can be carried down towards the lake as well. Um, invasive species, uh, so those can overtake and choke out uh, various native plants and animals. It can alter the natural shoreline balance. Um, many types of invasive plants are introduced unknowingly uh, by gardeners or uh, by windspread. Others are uh, hitchhikers that are brought in by boats, um, by uh, all-terrain vehicles or other equipment. So uh, on the top right-hand corner, we have uh, Phragmites australis, which is arguably the most problematic invasive species that we have on our lake here on shoreline. And last but not least, uh, amongst others is plastic and garbage pollution, which has numerous effects as well. Um, it can be mistaken as food, by wildlife that can cause entanglement, um, all leading to either impairment or, or death, unfortunately, of wildlife. And there's also additional stressors on our ecosystem, um, and that's one is of a changing climate. So um, we're cre we know that uh, a changing climate is creating new, a new range of environmental conditions. So as the warming water reduces uh, the temperature between the land and the water, our atmosphere becomes more turbulent um, and we can expect stronger wind speeds to occur. Those wind speeds play a huge role in the formation and also the reformation of some of our uh, coastal ecosystems, specifically our sand beaches and dunes, um, uh, but, but others as well, There's, they, can, they can impact the surface erosion quite, quite heavily. So those living on the shoreline may need to adapt to those changing conditions in the future. Um, or otherwise it may mean a risk of uh, the loss of our shoreline health, of our vitality and the, and the aesthetic appeal of the shorelines of both uh, Lake Huron and, and the Georgian Bay. There's lots of stewardship measures that can help build up the natural environment along the shoreline. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the, towards the end of the webinar. Um, and that's, uh, that's mainly to uh, make our coast a little bit more adaptable, more resilient to meeting those uh, changes ahead. Um, one of our uh, biggest examples is sand beaches and dunes, which can act like an insurance policy for those next high water uh, level periods. And then cumulative impacts along the shoreline. So for example, uh, the clearing of a single waterfront property might have little effect on the surface uh, runoff of the water and maybe a seawall hardening only straightens a small portion of the shore. However, over time, all these small, uh, seemingly insignificant impacts, when they're combined, 
with um, all those of other shoreline users can become a large cumulative impact on the shoreline, which is an additional stressor for both um, the environment and both for our neighbors uh, downdrift. So to set the context for today's webinar, uh, the definition of shoreline development, it can range from developing new housing subdivisions, uh, rebuilding an existing cottage, rebuilding a staircase to the beach or installing a revetment uh, along the shoreline. The focus of the webinar today will be on clarifying um, any misunderstanding around who owns the shoreline such as the beach and what agencies are involved in managing that shoreline development when it comes to projects that we uh, that private property owners are interested in, in doing on, on the shoreline. So regulations, uh, they comprise both of the land and water considerations. And yes, they're complicated um, because our shoreline is complex. It might be less complicated for development um, more inland, which doesn't have a coastline or in areas where there is no large surface water body. But um, because we live, play and work along the Lake Huron shoreline, we do need to understand its complexity and how the two work together. So I mentioned before, the Great Lakes hold about 20% of the world's fresh water. Uh, being in international waters, international waters as well, there's strong federal interest in many of the aspects of uh, shorelines, such as maintaining and improving water quality, helping wildlife communities that thrive on that water quality. So that could be fish, that could be migratory birds, um, and addressing water quality issues. So specifically air, um, what are called areas of concerns. So those have um, high level remedial action plans for uh, areas that are uh, industrially polluted areas. So um, some that kind of come to mind could be Sarnia. Um, uh, in the past, I think kind of Collingwood Harbor, Severn Sound had, had uh, some of these as well. And when it comes to the land, uh, there is provincial interest in managing the crown land along the shoreline. And that's going to include the bed of the lake as well. It will include the natural heritage, the species at risk I mentioned, um, or local tributary fisheries, um, wetlands to name a few. Some of this is delegated to conservation authorities who manage natural hazards of uh, flooding and erosion as well. So we'll get into that a bit as well. So the lake and the shoreline are a treasured resource and proper stewardship um, of it is not meant just for lakefront uh, landowners. Public access is key as this is a public resource and meant for the enjoyment of all. So that's why we also have a lot of public access laneways and uh, pathways. Crown land exists all along the shoreline, but the location does vary by the county that we live in. So for example, Bruce County tends to have uh, a shore or a road allowance that will separate the lakefront cottages from the beach. Um, whereas, for example, Huron and Lambton counties uh, are a mix of property ownership at the shoreline along with uh, crown land ownership at the shoreline. So um, there's also First, Na First Nation land claims that will also place a major role in access to the shoreline. So regardless, of who owns the land, uh, the bed of the lake um, is commonly reserved for the Crown. Um, and so that's administered by the province, Provincial Minister of Natural Resources. So if you find yourself uh, taking a walk on the beach and landowners are claiming uh, beach owners, you can simply walk along the water or in the water um, and, and, and get by there. Uh, during low water levels, that land ownership of the beach tends to be less of an issue and it tends to only arise uh, as an issue when we have narrow beaches and that's typically during high water levels like we're seeing right now. Um, progressive planning uh, for certain shoreline subdivisions can retain or progressive planning that uh, for shoreline subdivisions that retain the shoreline more as a public space or a park space um, ten, can, can ensure that any remediation or protection work can be done on that larger scale rather than um, lot by lot and also has more ac uh, public access for folks to get down to the shore. So the past, present and future consideration uh, will help tell the story of shoreline development. 
Early cottages, cabins, and shacks were typically temporarily placed as close to the water or top of the bluff to maximize the view and were easily moved inland as needed. So for example, some areas had uh, runaway lots that were purchased directly behind the lakefront cottage. And for that reason, they were able to pick it up and move it back. Um, these structures, uh, Sheldon had any foundations um, and they would typically be constructed kind of slab on grade. And for those that did have one of these earlier cottages, they also likely had permanent homes that were for, uh, fully winterized and had all their amenities back in the city or in their hometown um, built to stay and obviously were not as easily moved and commonly with basements and, and full foundations. So um, those first early cottages like we that we had on the shore were much more uh, movable, temporary, and also placed much closer to the shoreline. There's a 1935 shoreline survey uh, from, that goes stretches from about Kettle Point to Goderich area, and it showed um, very few established cottage areas. So there were about 15 communities total. Some of uh, those are still there today, obviously Port Franks, Grand Bend, St. Joseph, Bayfield, and there's a lot of other smaller ones in between. But this meant that there was less people. There was far less dense cottages than there are now and less stress on the lake. Um, this was also a time in the 1930s uh, of low water levels on Lake Huron and, during, and also during a, an economically tough, tough time as well. And then in the 1960s decade, we had a more affluent time period, economically speaking, so post-war. Um, lots of baby boomers on the rise. Many areas began, were uh, subdivided for, for more cottage development. And so this, I'll have a chart of, of water levels and historical water levels in the future, but this was also a time of low water level, which also meant wider beaches and potentially those false expectations of how permanent that wide beach actually would be when those subdivisions of cottages were going into place. Then moving into the mid 1980s, we saw a record high water level in Lake Huron. Many of those structures that were put in place, many of the structures were, were put in place to protect those cottages that were so close to the shore. Um, most of those structures that, are, that were placed in there are now nearing uh, their lifespan now. And we're also uncovering various uh, tools that were used to protect the shore. So one example, uh, last fall, we saw old sandbags um, that and old tires that are filled with concrete that are now being exposed from under the dune system and the owner at the at the property now had no idea that that was in there so the property was purchased um, a few years ago and uh, likely these uh, the sandbags and the the tire with the concrete was put in during the last high water level so lots of stuff that we're uncovering from those dune systems that are eroding away and then when we move to the 2000s uh, to present, we have seen and continue to see more folks retiring um, at the cottages, uh, more permanent uh, homes, more cottages being turned into permanent homes um, and spending summers along the shores of Lake Huron and perhaps winters as well or elsewhere. So the evolution of shoreline development often allowed and continues to allow and permit uh, a lot of rebuilding of existing cottages using the same footprint. But as I mentioned before, that footprint may sometimes be too close to the shoreline hazards of, um, of both flooding and erosion. And lake levels, we, we like to use these two comparison photos um, to show how lake levels influence how much sand can be on the shoreline. Here's an area on Bruce Beach of the same location, both under high water and low water levels in 1986 with uh, the record high, we had eroding dunes and we had that narrow beach. You can see the, the uh, shed um, or boathouse structure there. And then in 2005, on the right hand side, you can see a wider beach and those dunes rebuilding themselves toward, towards the lake. So how wide the beach is um, and how wide the shore is, is very much connected to our water levels. So again, as a, when I was going through the evolution of uh, div development, um, I was pointing to some of these dates. So um, to note those extremely low Lake Huron water levels in the mid 1950s and 19, mid 1960s. And then again, from uh, 2000 to about 2015. Um, since re now moving forward to, to present day, um, since reaching peak levels last summer 
and fall, all the Great, Lake, Great Lakes have experienced greater than average seasonal declines. Um, so our Michigan here on monthly mean level in April was about 176.95. Um, uh, so that's 55 centimeters above average, um, but 35 centimeters below last April. And that's when we had, um, that's when also the lake was experiencing a, a record high as well. So what's interesting uh, is that Lake Michigan Huron's level levels did not actually change over the month of uh, April to May of this year, whereas it typically rises by about 11 centimeters. So um, Environment Climate Change Canada says this is about the only the third time since um, 1918 when record keeping began that the water level has not changed between the months of April and May. So um, moving forward, uh, at the start uh, month of May, we had well above average and that's expected to, and it's a, expected to remain above average, um, even if we have uh, drier conditions. In the event that uh, we have wetter than, that we have a wetter than average summer, um, we're still not expected to reach those record levels just because of our, uh, of our spring. And in 2000, uh, 2020, we saw a record uh, breaking high water level. And so that caused a lot of shoreline property owners stress, a lot of loss and potential financial burden. So unfortunately, a lot of those pre-existing historical developments that were built very close to the shoreline were heavily impacted. And here's just a couple examples of that from last year. So if you're planning to develop or alter the shoreline, um, you'll most likely need approval from at least one agency and possibly several different ones, depending on the nature of the work. Um, this process can be a bit confusing and a bit daunting, um, but one or more agencies may have to review and provide uh, approval to ensure that your project proceeds safely and that it does not negatively impact both uh, the aquatic environment, water quality, and in endangered species, and any adjacent properties as well. So, um, also important to note is that rules and regulations can change over time. Um, those regulations reflect changes in the environment and also government policy. So consulting with experts, um, which I'll mention uh, at the end as well for advice and direction, is definitely time well spent ahead of, ahead of time. So who does what? Uh, this multi-layered, multi-agency permitting process is necessary because each agency is focused on protecting a different aspect of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay shorelines. So rules, regulations, and the permit process is there to keep people and their investments safe and to protect the environment. Um, by keeping development out of those hazard zones, you can reduce your vulnerability to those shoreline hazards. Um, and the need to protect your investment by hardening your shoreline. So this in turn can provide um, lots of opportunity to maintain a more natural shoreline as well. So here's just the hierarchy um, of, of uh, which agency, um, the hierarchy of the agency, and I'll just quickly go through which, which, uh, what each agency does here. So for federal authorities, um, if your work or activity has the potential to negatively impact any fish habitat, you might require authorization from uh, the Federal Fish Fisheries Act and the Species at Risk Act. Um, during low water levels, it is important to note that DFO considers all shoreline habitat equal to or below the elevation of the International Great Lakes Datum um, to be fish habitat, whether it is wet or dry. Uh, DFO does have partnership agreements with various conservation authorities uh, where those conservation authorities can provide assistance and carry out um, the initial review of the project on behalf of DFO. Um, and there's just their information as well, but there's lots of info on their website on the, the reviewing process and application works. Um, and Transport Canada, any work or structure that's going to potentially interfere with uh, public right of way of navigation might also require approval from uh, Transport Canada under the Navigable Waters Protection Act. So for example, it could mean um, you're putting in a very long dock that's extending into a bay and could impact uh, boating activities or something like that. Provincial authorities, so any work occurring on uh, shorelands might require a permit under the Public Lands Act. Uh, shorelands are land covered or seasonally inundated with water 
um, from lake, river, stream, or pond uh, during the last 12 months. And that includes both pub, uh, private and publicly owned land. So they, um, these are changes that, um, that obviously uh, there's water level changes annually, so they can rise and fall there as well. Um, this area also includes the, lake, the bed of the lake. So a work permit might be required for any work that's occurring in that area. Um, if you're also deciding to change any water flow on your property, for example, diverting or increasing the flow, uh, holding back water or potentially working on a dam, that might require MNRF approval under the Lakes and Rivers Improvement Act. And then we also have the Niagara Escarpment uh, Commission. So to ensure that if, if your property is located um, anywhere within the escarpment um, and you want to ensure that uh, the escarpment's natural resources, um, health, and the ecosystems are protected. Um, Niagara Escarpment landowners are required to get a what's called a Niagara Escarpment Development Permit, a little bit of a mouthful, but um, there might be other approvals for certain types of developments as well. And conservation authorities, so we've probably all heard of conservation authorities and likely worked or dealt with them. Um, they're based on riverian watersheds and they manage natural resources within those watersheds. Um, you might require a permit and approval under their Conservation Authorities Act. Um, lands that are adjacent or close to shorelines, uh, close to tributaries and wetlands of Lake Huron and Georgian Bay could be affected by uh, flooding, by erosion, or by uh, dynamic beaches. That would all be regulated by a conservation authority. So there's, um, there's six within our area here. <clears throat> Um, and most of us are probably quite familiar with, with some of these. And you might also require to get approval for site alterations. So um, we do have uh, county authorities and municipal authorities, but typically conservation authorities will let you know if you need to contact your local county or your municipal government office to determine if there's any permits required there. So really it's the two that um, you're interested in uh, is the conservation, your local conservation authority and the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry Office. And Indigenous communities, they may have uh, treaty rights and land, land claims that can be impacted by a pro, uh, proposed shoreline alteration. So these will vary depending on the community, but if you live within one of those communities or lease land or lease a cottage within one of those communities, um, it is best practice and to, to consult the community. Um, the regulatory agencies that I mentioned before as well will likely reach out and consult with those Indigenous communities as well um, when, a, when an application goes through uh, to consult how to address uh, any potential concerns. So planning a project. Um, how do you ensure that your shoreline project is sustainable? Um, before, any, before starting any project, um, we suggest asking yourself whether the work is absolutely necessary, um, what alternatives are available, and if it's better to do nothing or just keep it natural, um, it's best not to undertake the changes to the shoreline if it's not absolutely necessary. But um, as mentioned before, with certain projects uh, uh, with uh, cottages that were built um, prehistorically, there, there are lots of instances where a, a shoreline development will be necessary. So if it is necessary, there's a five-step process that can help you prepare and submit your application. Um, if you uh, want to just glaze over this now and then come back to it <laughs> because the webinar will be recorded, um, there is a lot here, but um, the steps are really helpful for organizing yourself, organizing your ideas. Um, first, you want to contact, uh, like I mentioned, your Conservation Authority staff or your MNRF staff to obtain that advice on how to proceed um, before designing your project and before submitting your application. So this should be done well in advance of your plan start date. Um, as some of those sites might have specific timing windows for construction. So especially any in-water work, um, there might be fisheries concerns, fishery spawning concerns. Next, you want to make sure that your design work does not interfere with uh, your neighbor's use and their enjoyments. Better yet, um, you can include them in your discussions, hopefully, if you have a good relationship with your neighbor. 
Um, and at this point, it's also important to consider any alternatives to your project. So is relocating an option, is um, redesigning your area uh, an option, um, mitigation an option, all of this to lessen the impacts um, as opposed to building or hardening up at this point. And then step number three, you would complete the appropriate application. Um, you'd have a site plan, a location map. Uh, you'll likely need a copy of a deed or like your latest tax bill uh, to go along with that. Um, and be prepared for a site visit um, so you can start staking off your location um, of all your proposed works on the, uh, out on the property. And it just helps visualize both for yourself and for anybody that's coming out. And step number four, at this point, uh, your application would be being reviewed and uh, any field inspections that may need to occur would be happening. So depending on the nature of your work, uh, either the Conservation Authority or the MNRF um, may need to forward your application either to uh, DFO or uh, a First Nation office. And if and when the project is approved, a permit would be issued uh, with conditions to be followed. So that leads us to step number five, which is um, installing your construction measures and ensuring that uh, you're going according to your plan and your permit conditions as well. And there's a couple regulation limits um, to be aware of for those living, especially living along a dynamic beach system. So um, most of us will have the flooding and erosion hazard limit, but the dynamic beach hazard limit um, is an additional uh, limit for those living in within a dynamic beach as well. So something to keep in mind. And some tips on getting permits, uh, advice and direction. So like I mentioned before, contacting staff from the approval agencies as early as possible in the planning stage for your project um, to determine if your project feasibility um, is feasible. Um, what permits would be required and the approximate timeline for, for those permits being issued. Um, with high water levels, there's lots of interest in, um, in permits. So uh, again, if that's something that you're considering, um, planning that ahead of time. Uh, submitting everything at once and making sure that your application is complete and accurate. Um, the next one, most agencies have application packages that they can outline what items must be submitted um, with a completed application form. So taking the time to really read these carefully and being aware of what you'll be required from uh, each agency and um, that, that might save you quite a bit of time later on and unnecessary frustration later on. Um, it's like when we're reading those terms and conditions sometimes and what we're signing, but it is, it is uh, important to read through that before submitting submitting that in. And additionally, submitting a complete application will allow your application to be processed as efficiently and hopefully as quickly as possible. Anything that's incomplete or inaccurate um, is one of the main reasons that approval processes take longer than expected. Uh, lastly, uh, second to last, when you're applying for permits while well in advance um, that you wish to work, that you wish to do the work, again, um, just gives you a little bit of time uh, for site inspections and further consultations. Perhaps you want a second opinion. Um, so it gives you a little bit more time there. And lastly, uh, staff are there to help ensure coordinated review um, by letting you know which other agencies that you'll need to apply to, um, circulating those approvals. But keep in mind that the landowner is ultimately responsible to ensure that uh, permits are in place prior to conducting any work. So I talked a little bit about the past, I talked a little bit about the present, but what about going forward? Um, what does the future hold? So real estate sale uh, prices have been increasing substantially, especially as we work from home, uh, our aspirations to work from home, and we have better internet service in certain rural uh, communities. So this, uh, this is allowing us for this kind of new concept of, um, of our work and life balance from home. So more people are moving to the Lake Huron coastline uh, from other parts of Ontario, from larger cities. And also with COVID-19, uh, we're seeing an influence from, uh, from that as more individuals experience the natural environment along Lake Huron. So whether it be coming to the beach for the first time, whether it be uh, driving to the trails on Lake Huron for the first time or some of our provincial parks. So 
again, we're experiencing um, an increase, a continued increase in population um, and development along the shores of Lake Huron. So practicing good stewardship when we're living on, when we're using or managing our shoreline property makes a lot of good sense. Um, here's, I'll go through just a few frequent, uh, frequently asked questions that were asked along the shoreline typically. Um, so why is my shore washing away? Um, we want to help nature do its job in preventing erosion. So leaving any rocks, any logs along the shoreline, keeping natural vegetation in its place. Um, in addition, supplementing, so planting additional native grasses, native shrubs and trees that, that are gonna help the soil, help stabilize it and help support the shore. Um, there's lots of bioengineering approaches that use a mix of natural materials such as logs, living stakes, uh, brush bundles called wattles and they, they help uh, control erosion. Uh, acknowledging that where erosion is severe and the property structure is at risk, that's when you do need to consult a coastal professional or a coastal engineer before spending uh, money on shoreline structures. It's always good to get an opinion um, with what's happening at the shore. And planting those deep rooted vegetation species above and behind uh, your shoreline treatment to fill those voids and increase the effectiveness in the lifespan. Um, staying away from certain structures like gabion baskets or vertical retaining walls. Those are often deflect wave energy um, and that can cause wave scouring and, and can even uh, collapse the wall later on. Uh, the weeds on the shore. So a weed plant is something, uh, a plant that's in the wrong place. Uh, getting to know your plants as they're not all weeds and not all invasive species at the shore. Um, some are likely native and be beneficial for beach health. Um, don't be fooled by those images of our plant, of plant-free beaches that you often see in res uh, a lot of resort brochures. Our beaches on Lake Huron are places where plants need to grow. Um, when a beach lacks vegetation, it's likely going to take a lot of money and effort for it to maintain it in the future and it will likely decrease the quality of the beach itself. So um, we often see quite a bit of turf grass. Um, so we say, you know, maintaining that too close to, um, when it's maintained too close to the dunes, it can create an opportunity for those um, common weeds to escape into the beach and into the dune area. And not only do they change the appearance of the beach, but they can also uh, prevent native plants from growing and they can attract uh, geese to the shoreline as well. Uh, getting to know the plants at your shoreline is that first step to knowing what's non-native, uh, invasive or native. Um, our native plants have adapted to local conditions and provide habitat for wildlife, insects, birds, but also great for stabilization. So. Uh, this little photo here diagram shows the difference between root lengths of uh, fescue turf grass and our American uh, beach grass. So if we think about which one would likely hold the sand better, well American beach grass is likely the winner in this category. Um, turf grass again close to the beach can, can attract uh, geese um, and their waste on the beach as well. So native plants do require fewer inputs, so fewer water, uh, less water, uh, less fertilizer and pesticides to be maintained. And invasive species. So when it comes to invasive species, um, monitoring your garden and your beach area, um, know, watching those escapees from gardens or lawns, um, and looking for some major culprits that we see at the, at the shoreline. So Phragmites, uh, spotted knapweed, sweet white clover. We have a lot of resources as to how to identify those, which can be found on our, on our website. Having a buffer strip, so an area that's vegetated, uh, an area of land that's vegetated adjacent to the shoreline that's going to help minimize direct runoff to the lake. Um, the most effective buffer will have a mix of low plants, shrubs, and trees, um, again for improving wildlife habitat, erosion, and uh, water quality as well. And for those that live on a bank that uh, is seeing quite a bit of erosion, um, a lot of rocky bluffs rarely pose a problem, but those steep slopes of loose soils that have clay or soft rock um, are definitely going to be prone to erosion or, or sliding. So if you're concerned about the stability of your slope, definitely seek the advice of a geotechnical specialist. Um, a stable slope is typically at about a three to one ratio 
Um, whereas a lot of the, the banks and the bluffs and the Goddard area specifically are, are almost at a one-to-one. -one. So um, getting some advice and professional advice there is uh, key to knowing what's happening and avoiding any uh, weight bearing structures, um, building stairways, parking, storage areas close to the edge of your bluff or your bank um, is also quite, uh, quite vital. So I mentioned a little bit about shoreline professionals. Um, since shorelines are complex areas, most projects will require, will require technical assistance with either the design, uh, the permit process, um, construction, and even maintenance. So hiring the right professional may help make the, the whole project run smoothly and prevent you from uh, pulling out a lot of your hair <laughs> during the process. Um, so assess the scale of the work and determine what portion you need help with. Um, an experienced coastal engineer may be needed for those larger projects, but um, professional advice should definitely include options and alternatives that will help with the shoreline type uh, at your shoreline and the conditions. So it's also important to get a second opinion if possible and necessary. And so why is all of this important um, to bring it all back home? Lake Huron is the drinking water source for around 3 million people in both Canada and the United States. Many of our coastal communities rely on water from the lake, uh, including many First Nation and Métis community, who, communities who, uh, whose water treatment plants source water from the lake. Um, but even inland cities rely on the Great Lake as well. So for example, London, Ontario, sources about 80% of its drinking water from Lake Huron through a pipeline uh, just, just north of Grand, that's uh, just north of Grand Bend. And it's also important to think about uh, all of the ways that we value the waterways around us and how that shapes our lifestyle and our daily actions at the shoreline, or even if, if you're a property owner or if you're just visiting. Um, many of the ecosystems along Lake Huron and Georgian Bay, especially our beaches, are experience, experience great fluxes in recreation during the summer months. Um, and in most cases, a, tour, a tourism boost that uh, contributes to the local economy. So in our experience um, at the Coastal Center, tourism and conservation are not mutually exclusive um, and a healthy functioning system can help reduce the stress on the shoreline, um, making it more resilient to that increased use and preserving the shoreline quality for the long term. So we actively work with municipalities and local community groups in planning better ways to care for our coastal environments. Feel free to visit our website, uh, lakehuron.ca, or send us an email if you have any questions, um, or even if you have a photo that you're, a uh, plant that you're looking to identify at the shoreline, we always enjoy seeing those. And join us on July 20th. So that will actually be all about coastal plants. So maybe before you send the photo, you can attend our webinar um, and we'll be able to go through some of uh, the most common plants that we can find on our uh, Lake Huron shorelines. And I think we'll go through some uh, species at risk along with invasive uh, plants that we can find as well. And once again, I'd like to show our appreciation for the generous funding from uh, RBC, Bruce Power, and Toyota Bosch, who uh, these free events would not be possible without the support of these organizations and also individuals like yourself listening today. So if you'd like to make a donation to our charitable programs, you can uh, visit our website at lakehuron.ca slash donate or give us a call or an email as well. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Daniela. Um, that was a lot of really great and interesting information. Um, we do have some time for questions. So if you uh, can think of a, a question for Daniela, um, please post it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen or the chat box. Um, we will be monitoring them both. So. Definitely. And if you happen to have a question later uh, after the presentation as well, um, the email is posted on uh, the screen right here right now and we might be able to give you a more detailed response. A lot of shoreline development questions are very case by case specific. Um, so if you do have something specific to your shoreline or the, eco the type of shoreline that your property is at, then um, it might warrant an, an email to us as well at, uh, at coastalcenter at lakehuron.ca. <laughs> So 